You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. My guy. Pastor Carl yes, Lynch. Sir. Welcome back. Pleasure to be back, my brother. Pastor Carl has finally uh, putting out his book, Own the Moment. It's just, this must be meant for me to read. I started reading it last night because somebody gifted me a book called The Power of Moments. And then here comes your book called Own the Moment. We're on to something. And I like it. It says, make the most of what you do have. Don't be so fixed on the future that you miss the power of the present. Why is it so hard to focus on it now, Pastor Carl? Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on your bestseller. Thank you, sir. Holler. Um, I think people need hope right now and reminders that, you know, we can't do a lot about a lot, but we can do something about what we have, you know, in our hands right now. And that's why I wrote it, because I think, you know, these are frustrating times and people need to know. We can do something about what we're, what we're a part of. You know, mm -hmm. whatever job you have, wherever you find yourself, there's more power in it than you probably think. So and you're right. We spend so much time like videotaping what's going on instead of yeah. living in that moment. Living in the moment. That's right. You know, you go to a show and you're like, oh, I got to make sure I put this on my uh, Snapchat. Or you're, you said you're with your son. He's riding his bike. You're taking a picture of him riding his bike. But sometimes you need to just experience and live in that moment. Well, we are living in the moment. Just living it through our phones, which is whack. Right. Put your phone down. Yeah. Like you have, you have eyes, you have a memory, you know, sometimes that stuff's better. So yeah, I think we got, uh, we got a moment in time right now, culture wise to, to do something. I mean, it's really easy to criticize. There's a lot to criticize perhaps, mm -hmm. but, um, my goal, somebody once said we need less fingers in the culture, more thumbs. Like, mm -hmm. what am I going to do about this? Mm -hmm. And everybody can point and judge and yell, but, uh, I still think that there's a time and a place for that, but I want to be somebody who's found trying to make a difference. You get criticized a lot, but you seem to embrace the hate, so to speak. You know, they criticize you about your tattoos, your <laughs> pectoral muscles, okay, your your sense of dress. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe they're right about the sense of dress. I need help. <laughs> somebody, somebody holler at me. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you can't expect to make a difference and have everybody get it. You know, if your goal is to be understood, it's a boring life anyway. So mm -hmm. I think for me, I've learned how to almost measure how I'm doing by who doesn't like me. There, <laughs> there are some people where I don't want you to like me. You know, we said when that. When the right people don't well, like you. <laughs> we said, yeah, we said that in our church. Like, you know, for instance, if you're if you're an overt racist person, I'm not sure I want you to be comfortable with me. Mm. And if you are taking ground, that means you're taking ground from somebody. So, you know, for me, when people criticize us, I just we say, God bless you, and, and you know, if you don't want to take the time to get to know us and what we do, that's on you. Well, John Lennon said that once. He said, being honest may not get you many friends, but it always gets you the right ones. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Now, it was also really important to you, you said in this book, for you to actually write it yourself. Yes. And maybe, and Shar, you know this from writing your book, I, yeah. I haven't been through a process like this ever. Like, I, I wasn't prepared for how, how vulnerable it was, but I felt like, you know, there's nowhere, there's nowhere to go from writing your own book because you can't blame it on somebody else's spin. You That's can't say I was misquoted. Correct. So the, as, as empowering as it is, it's also like, whoa, you know, this is on me. But I wanted to make sure that I gave, you know, my voice to our story and, and for better or for worse. I think it's smart to use writers and, and ghost writers and, and editors and all that. But for me, you know, I just felt like I'm just going to I'm going to lay this out there. It I is can't what it do is. it. I tried. You know what I mean? I tried to do the whole recording thing and then let somebody transcribe it for you. <laughs> but that don't work. No. You know what I'm saying? Like you get somebody to help you edit it, of course, because my grandma and punctuation is horrible. All right, yeah. But our, our tech, it yeah. got to be your words. Yeah, I, I think I did the same thing. Like I, I had a my editor who was awesome. He was like, let me try a chapter. And, and, he, and he wrote one. I was like, man, I. I love you, but you weren't there. You I don't know agree. what I meant by right. that, my, the tone, and I'm just going to try it my, you know, myself. And, you know, it, my mom loves it already. So I feel <laughs> like if Kathy Lentz, hi, Mom, I love you, by the way, um, if, if she likes it, I'm good. In the book, you say, uh, forget living the dream and learn to embrace the beauty of your reality. Explain that. I feel like everybody talks about, like, the dream scenario. You know, we normally compare our lives to somebody else's Instagram, mm -hmm. you know, or behind the scenes to somebody else's sports center, highlight mm -hmm. reel. And I feel like it's awesome to have dreams, obviously, but we got to do something with what we have right now. Because if you're always waiting for the ideal thing, we miss so many moments that could matter right now. So for me, I, I got big dreams. All that stuff's great. But I also have a responsibility to do as much as I can with what I have right now. So it's twofold. It's not like no dreams. I'm not like anti-dream. Um, I think, you know, Martin Luther King was 
I have a dream, but he said it while he was walking. Mm. And to me, there's so much power in that. There's, I know a lot of people were like, someday I'm gonna I'm have a show like The Breakfast Club. It's like, cool, where do you do your internship? Mm-hmm. You know, what are you studying? And I think we, we gotta raise up a generation that's willing to dream and willing to work. Because they don't, they don't, you know, work without each other. But how do they balance that? Because that, that's a that's a that's tough balancing. I think you, you, you got to keep your hand to the plow, so to speak. So I, I've never once waited for an opportunity. I mm-hmm. think it's like I'm going to look at opportunities. I'm going to knock and I'm going to keep moving, but I'm not going to wait. I'm going to do, you know, the best I can with what I have right now. And I think God always blesses that. And I, I do believe that we're because I'm a Christian, you end up looking a lot better than you really are. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's not that we work harder or somebody who's successful is better necessarily. It just means sometimes God can, God can breathe on what you're working with. Do you, you believe know? in karma? Um, I believe in sowing and reaping. Karma is a different word, but the concept of you get out what you put in mm-hmm. to a degree. Okay. Why to a degree? Because I believe in it wholeheartedly. I mean, I, I believe in it wholeheartedly as well, but I do believe like if we all got what we deserved as a, as a Christian, uh. I'm thinking... <laughs> I don't deserve to walk with, with God. I don't deserve to know Jesus. I don't deserve anything I've got to that to that point. Um, but beyond that, on like an earthly practical level, yeah, you get out what you put in. Like don't they don't expect this to grow if you're not gonna water it, if you're not gonna, you know, grind for it at all. And I was actually talking, I was in the Gucci store the other day, right? And these girls stole Gucci belts, right? And I was thinking to myself, I was like, you know, they ran out there, stole the, yeah. the Gucci belts, but obviously they knew because the, the security didn't grab them because I guess they couldn't, and they knew that, so they just walked out with the belts. And I was thinking to myself, what? "Damn, something's gonna come back to them. Like, wait, something, something yeah, happens to one of their So wait, like, so somebody could just walk out the store with the stuff, and they can't do anything. I didn't tell you that, but so that's what happened. Which store exactly? Okay, is by this? the way, I don't believe that. Cause I'm gonna tell you something. I was in Saks Fifth Avenue, <laughs> and this guy was thought he was clear and walked out. They was like Secret Service. Like they got a system. Every undercover cop in there came down on this person so crazy. But this store, they don't, because I guess they've had threats on lives before or things, people have done something. So they, their whole thing is, don't risk your life. Call the police. You know what I mean? If you can and stop the them, not, but if not. Gotcha. But I was just thinking that, damn, they stealing these belts and these hats and these shirts and these scarves. It's going to come back to them and something's going to happen to them. So wait, security just has to stand there and not do anything? I'm, I don't work there yet. I'm not sure, but I'm just telling you what I heard. <laughs> That's well, crazy you know, But I, I felt like yeah. the karma w- will come back times 10 to people, you know? I feel like there's there's something to be said for what you're sowing into. So if you keep looking for a relationship in a club, feel free to understand that's also going to be exactly what you draw from, right? right. So for me, I'm, I do believe in karma in that I want to sow I want to sow what I want to see. Mm. That's what we always tell our church. Like don't don't say you want to see the city change. Don't say that and not sow into that. So there's a lot of people who are like I want a good relationship. Well, where are you drawing from? I want to mm. have a great career. Where, where are you going to school? Where are you studying? And I think before you say it, you got to be willing to sow into it. That's that's my goal. I don't want to complain about something. I'm not going to, um, you know, work work at changing. Now, I was very inspired by you talking about being in school and having to get up in front of the class mm. and just not being able. You said you ran out of the room and yeah. went to the bathroom and you were just terrified. But now look at you. Yeah. Well, I think I, I've never I never thought I'd be a, a preacher or a public speaker. And sometimes we do a bad job, preachers, of telling people the journey. So, so people see you at a certain place in your life and you're like, this is, you know, I heard a preacher one time say, you know, God called me to preach at five. And I was like, I don't believe you. I've got a five year old. God ain't talking to him about preaching. Um, so for my journey was one of just stepping into weakness, not waiting to get strong. Mm-hmm. And I think over the years I've seen God you know, just give me confidence and give me grace and, and, and really help me and stuff. I'm not, I don't think I'm naturally good at. So I, I remember the first time I was asked to speak, I just, I literally just dipped out of the room as fast as I could. And I just made a decision and you know, hiding. I'm not going to hide anymore. If God saved my life, he'll also sustain my life. And I think we're, we're, we're cool to trust God that he can save us, but not build our lives. I don't want to just trust them up front. You know, I want to be throughout my life say, all right, Lord, this is, this is out of my depth. But help me. I'm going to keep on stepping out. I love that idea of not just living up to your potential, yeah. but exceeding what your own expectations are of yourself. Potential? If, if someone looked at me one day and they said, Carl, you really lived up to your potential, I feel like I would be doing God a disservice. You know, I don't, mm. I don't potential. It's like I want to be that guy who people are like, no way. I can't believe There's it. no way. <laughs> a dude from Virginia. Shout out, Envy, to all the Hampton U people. There you go. Um, <laughs> 
I, I love that. I love how people know me from like, that's what's cool about going to your hometown though. Cause people know you, you can't fake anything in your hometown. Not at so all. like when people see me, they're like, okay, I used to be an atheist, but you I'm interested mm -hmm. because you can't fake where you're from, what you, well, who you are. And so when people see my life, there's no explanation for it other than maybe what he believes is real. Cause he's not that good. He's that, not that anything. That whole concept of potential is interesting because you never can quite live up to it because you don't really know what it is. I guess you might have your own goals and your own things that you right. want to accomplish, but most of the time potential is based off what people say about you after the fact. And, yeah. and you kind of addressed that in the Own the Moment chapter when you said that trendsetters and moguls and true pioneers were never really accepted or appreciated in their time. Ever. Ever. And they never will be. You know, like Colin Cap, for instance, like, you know, he's vilified one minute and now it's starting to change. The narrative's different. There will come a day when people will be like, you got to you, you gotta kneel. You got to stand for yeah. what you believe. But I, I think, number one, we need to appreciate people right now. And, and number two, yeah, no, nobody who's ever stepped out um, was cool in that moment. Nobody, so, not Martin Luther King Jr., not Muhammad Ali, none of these people we idolize now, none of them. Nobody. And, and that's, that's we, people, we live in a culture where everybody is desperate to be approved of mm -hmm. you can't change culture if mm -hmm. you if your number one goal is for people to like you i think the the essence of change is being willing to say i'm out here by myself and we have a phrase at church don't ask god to you know deliver you from your own prayer requests so you can't on one hand say god you know use me to uh go out on waters that i've never been on and then next week pray that you know you feel shaky or god use me to reach people and next week ah, people are walking all over me it's like i said that in the book if you ask God to use you, he will. So be careful before you say some things because he'll he's looking for available people. You know what I want to ask? You know, a lot of times people use superstitious things, yep. religious things like uh, St. Francis statue. They might bury in their garden to get a fruitful garden or the, the St. Joseph statue if they want to sell those, sell their homes. What do you think about that? Because I feel like you're playing a little bit, you know, what I mean, because that might not be what God wants. And you, you might be playing with the other side. I, I don't want to necessarily disrespect somebody's superstitious view without, you know, relationship or context. But I will say, because you asked, this is on Envy, so if you're mad, mm -hmm. email me at djmv.com. Um, <laughs> I think I, I only want to worship or pray to something that can save my life. Yeah. And that, that falls on Jesus alone. So if you have a statue, it might make you feel, make you feel better. But I don't think, you know, you holding beads while you pray makes your prayer better. Mm -hmm. I don't think you putting a little crystal uh, on your garden somehow going to bring energy to your garden. That's my personal belief because I feel like if, you, if you're going to put your faith in something, it better be supernatural. Right. And so, yeah, ha have your trinkets, have your, have your things that someone said was supernatural, but really- What about I like saging the house? What do you mean by saging? You know how you take the sage, you burn sage and- you I mean, houses need to smell better. So if that's what it's going to, you know, all that stuff to me, like we get a lot of tradition that we turn into theology. And I think tradition can be cool, but at the same time, you know, I, I want to reserve my faith for stuff that's supernatural. So I don't, I don't think some of the stuff that we've put our faith in can actually make any difference at all. Is that part of the, the lies we love? You break that Did down. Did you like that chapter? chapter? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's going to get me into some good trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I feel like you have to know what truth is mm -hmm. to be able to build your life correctly. In the, in the essence of truth, that has to be the foundation. So if you build your life on a lie, like all men are bad, you're going to have you know relationships, and you've probably met people like this who, who have an inherent belief that men are bad. That oh, my was, gosh. I have arguments all the time. My friends would be like, every man cheats, all men cheat. I'm like, not all men cheat. No, the men that you are around right. have cheated. So I think for me, we have to get to a place where we understand Let's go truth first. Let's build from that. Let's not build from our opinion and what we think is going to work and then hope it works out. So, yeah, I think the lies we love chapter hopefully is going to be helpful for people because in the book I say, you know, some of these things you think are true, they might not be true. Like people say, Carl, doesn't, doesn't God hate money? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, where do you get that from? And, you know, the Bible says they start mixing prayers like, you know, for God so loved the world that he is my shepherd in the valley. I'm like, yo, that's two different scriptures. <laughs> You're amalgamating. I think you have to know what what the truth is first and so i i think we got a lot of lies a lot of fake news um but a lot of the bible is, is a lie we love too though you explain please sir just in general like the bible was written by people to keep people oppressed like i mean that was one of the reasons that slave masters would use nat turner to go around and preach to the slaves i would hedge a little bit and say the interpretation yes, of the bible 
it, it was has been always butchered, including that. And that's happened with slavery. It's happened with women. It's happened with um, homosexuality, homosexuality, now. class systems. Like there are things where we need to look into. I don't think the, the Bible, I believe, is God's inspired word. He used fallible men to actually write an infallible message. Now, that that takes a lot of faith to believe that. But obviously, I've studied that. And there are other people who would say, yep. You know, if you look at the, the canon of Scripture, where we got God's inspired word from, um, you either believe that or you don't. But beyond that, I don't think that the Bible is racist. I don't think the Bible hates women. I think that the way we read it sometimes is not to change our lives. We try to change the Bible to fit our lifestyle. Okay, I'm going to push back a little bit. Let's break down a couple of chapters. In Deuteronomy 14, 8 says, you shouldn't touch the flesh of a pig, nonetheless eat it. But people will say, oh, if you just pray over the pork, it's fine. Really easy. So the Old Testament mm-hmm. exists to shine light on our need for Jesus. Mm-hmm. So the, without the Old Testament, we don't know how heavy the burden is of sin, of religion, of like a Deuteronomy. You read some of these Old Testament chapters. First of all, there's good stuff in there. But when you see things like do this and women who, who have to go outside the city during mm-hmm. their special time of the month, all this, the, all this stuff that can seem random, the point of it when you break it all down is to shine light on we can't live under this burden. So Deuteronomy, we believe because of Jesus, that's like, so if you look at the Old Testament, New Testament, the bridge that crosses it is Jesus. Anything that doesn't come through that cross is dead to us. That's why, you know, people say you shouldn't have tattoos. And I'm like, where'd you get that from? They're like Leviticus. I'm like, you understand the verse under that says you, you shouldn't cut your sideburns and you can't use two different types of cloth. Is that the point of the tattoo verse in Leviticus? Of course it's not. There's context to that. So if you look at anything from a distance, it's going to be distorted. Most people look at the Bible from an arm's length, and and you're never going to see it right. Okay, what about Adam and Eve being the first two people on the planet, having Cain and Abel, Cain killing Abel, but then going off and finding finding a wife? How? I think a lot of that's going to take some contextual research to go. Are you talking about how how it happened in the first place? How do you go find a wife if, if they tell us Adam and Eve were the first two? See, you're loving the lie right now. The, you're, you're loving the lie that is the Bible. It's okay. No, it's, I don't think I'm loving the lie. I think you, you, if you ask questions about Old Testament history mm-hmm. and Old Testament context, this stuff, you have to sit there and break it down and go, okay, this leads to that, that leads to this. And in the whole picture, yeah, it's going to make sense. But if I walked into the movie of Charlemagne the God's Life and came in chapter 7, and was like, that makes no sense. Monk's Corner, that's all I saw. And you're like, yeah, but there's some stuff that comes after it. That's what people have to do with the Bible. I think it's cheap to almost give but answers. But I mean, the first chapter. Yeah, but there's a lot of chapters that come after that. So if you just look at the beginning of anything, go Adam and Eve, there's no way that could have happened. And you start you know, going to every controversial part of the, of the Old Testament without saying, all right, I'm going to take the time to look at the whole thing in its essence. I think it would come up with a lot of lies that you love. What about the uh, the men? A man being with a man is an abomination in the eyes of God. It, that's what it says. So, what do you think about that? I think I got to read it through a New Testament lens and and go. Why did God say that? What's God's perfect plan? What does God believe about identity? What does God believe about um, you know relationships? Where does our sexuality come from? And I think when you start looking at it deeper, it takes longer and there's more conversations involved. Most Christians, some Christians are lazy, and they'll take something like that because they don't think there's going to be any questions after it. So I say, well, it says in the Bible this. Where does it say that? Why does it say that? Who is that for? So I think context is everything. It's hard for me to believe that the Bible is strictly God's word. It's hard for me to believe that because it's written through the lens of man, and man is, is flawed, you know, and man is going to put things in there that he agrees with and things that he doesn't, that he doesn't agree with. That, well, in order I, to keep order. I said up front, like, if you believe in the canon of Scripture, there's a faith leap right there to say, all right, I believe that God chose these specific chapters, these specific verses mm-hmm. to be his inspired word. You either believe that or you don't. And that's a huge that's a huge faith step, no doubt. People don't want to be religious anymore, it seems. They just want to be spiritual. Why do you, why do you think that is? Uh, because religion is much more boxed in and spirituality like nobody can define like i said some this to somebody the other day they're like well i i have faith and i said faith in what and they're like well i just have faith i said faith in nothing is nothing like you better have an object that you have your faith in so i'm not a man of faith i think i'm a guy who has faith in god faith in jesus and i think that makes 
the biggest difference. So spirituality right now is cool. Like you don't want to be on a date and meet somebody who's not spiritual. Like you, you have to say certain things right now to be accepted. And uh, I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit shallow. I think you got to go a little bit deeper. Now you, you got no problem speaking out about race relations in America. No. You have a chapter uh, called, if, if you're racist and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> I do. Expound on that a little. Does anybody ever clap? I'm just curious. Does anybody ever clap? <laughs> in Hillsong. Have you ever said that? And they, they started clapping. I mean, I think our church is special. I think we have people who are who are with it, you know, to use a cool, trendy word. You know, I don't know. People still say woke. My daughter told me no one says that anymore. Yeah, most uh, woke people are tired. They need some sleep. <laughs> I got one eye open, but I'm, I'm half woke. I think, yeah, I, I've said a lot right now about racial um, ridiculousness. Like to me, some of the stuff is so appalling that we have to talk about it, um, I get more passionate about it. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I stood up in church and talked about, for instance, white privilege, or if we get up and we say, um, do, you, do you have time to be empathetic? Because if I say something about a particular issue and you immediately are defensive, we might have a problem. Mm -hmm. So that whole chapter is about not calling someone a racist, but someone taking the time just to see where you got your thinking from, where you got your life lessons from, and could there be a racist thread in there that has colored your entire view? You know, we have to get better as a culture. And it's going to start with me not calling somebody else a racist, me looking in the mirror saying, is there something deep in my soul that maybe I had nothing to do with that mm -hmm. has caused me to treat people a certain way that uh, you know isn't isn't right. So that's what that chapter is about. I think it's pretty funny, but it's it's real to me because you know I'm raising daughters. I got a son, and I'm upset about the state of the union. Mm -hmm. But I also get encouraged when I get to look at them. Like my son wears the same shirt every day. It says black, white, crossed out, and it says human. Mm -hmm. It's his favorite shirt, and he wears it and goes to school, and you know he's proud of that because he he wants to be a part of change. He's eight years old. Mm -hmm. So although I'm I'm worried about the news cycle. And I'm worried about politics right now. I do see my son hanging out with um, the only non-white kids in his class at all times. I see my daughters, you know, having birthday parties where it's not just people who look like the Lentz family. And to me, there's hope in that. Is it hard to embrace somebody like, say, Harvey Weinstein wanted to come to Hillsong and he was like, I need some help. I need to talk. I need some guidance. Horny Weinstein. Last time I was here, you, you asked me about Charlie Sheen and here we are with Harvey <laughs> Weinstein. I'm like, Lord, help me. Let me get a peaceful news cycle. <laughs> Uh, no, it wouldn't be hard for me um, because Harvey Weinstein, he needs Jesus like I need Jesus. Mm -hmm. And are the consequences of his sin heavier? Absolutely. But uh, at the end of the day, that, that man needs help. And if there's any place he could ever come that would open up the doors, it would be ours. It doesn't mean that we absolve or endorse or advocate or excuse his behavior. It just means our answer is the same. No matter what your problem is, no matter what your sin is, no matter how big or small we might make it, I feel like we know we know what the answer is. So Harvey, um, you know, we're praying for him like we would anybody. It's sad and it's going to get worse. And it's interesting how on on one hand we honor Hugh Hefner when he passes away. The dude was a pornographer, but yet Harvey Weinstein is is this demon in culture right now. And I said we got to pick our now, poison here. I can't let here. you do that, Pastor. Carl, what did I do? Uh, Hugh Hefner was a he founded Playboy. He owned Playboy. Those playmates. What did I want to be there? They were consenting. Yes, Harvey, Harvey just, was using his power. No, I'm not. I'm guess. not likening what they said. I'm okay. saying what they represent. So we're mad on one hand about uh, what Harvey Weinstein has done, right? But the culture that created it, we also honor. What's the culture that created it? Like uh, womanizing, or what do you mean, like? Or you think pornography is? Yeah, I think that that. How can one thing be acceptable? And then we not expect things like the Harvey Weinstein thing to be accepted for so long. It's nothing wrong with sex, but it's something wrong with being a sexual predator. Absolutely. Yeah, in in no predator. way am I likening these two men together. What I'm saying is we have a culture that can't pick which direction we want to go. So it is, is Playboy, is Hugh Hefner worthy of honor right now? And yet, you know, we go to Harvey Weinstein and we vilify him, you know, up and down. I don't, I don't know. I think that sometimes like it gets... Two, two different things. One yeah, is two different things. Yeah, Harvey yeah. Weinstein did a lot of illegal... Yeah. You understand yeah. what I'm saying, though? No, we don't. They didn't anticipate. <laughs> Somebody out there does. <laughs> I don't know about that. No, 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 no I'm no, not no, saying no, they're no. the same thing. I'm saying the, the point is we have very, very murky water right now with morality. So I, I, that, that was my greater you point. You think pornography is immoral? I, I think the the evidence is there that pornography is destructive to anybody that's involved with it. Now, if someone's got better research, 
please show me. But from what I've seen and from what I know, um, I don't think it's it's helping anybody. Now you know that's just my view. That's why I'm sitting I, here so in the you, middle. You're like it fuels uh, like sexual desires more so than other things. I don't know. What I think mean. it definitely devalues um, what is what is right and what is holy. And I don't think you know. I think you can get to a point in culture where you're so ingrained to think some things are right. Um, you know, we start to we start to lose our sensitivity. So I think from from what I've studied, from what I know, the the people that I've walked through some some pretty nasty journeys with. Sometimes pornography is an ever-present factor in all these scenarios. So, it, hey, you, people need to make their own decisions. But, but porn you, isn't you, rape, though. No. It's not rape, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't it's saying that, guys. Assaulted. Come on now. I wasn't <laughs> saying that. He's <laughs> saying the culture that. I was talking about culture, and y'all are like, Harvey <laughs> and Hughes are not the same. I didn't say that. I'm just saying it, it looks to me hypocritical. I just feel like so many people watch pornography. Is I'm sure everybody in this room, right? I don't not watch, pass the car. I'm not watching pornography. <laughs> no, ma'am. I don't, watch, I don't watch porn anymore either. But I, I, you're, you, you hit it on the head, though, Angela, because the, it, if something happens enough, it becomes normal. True. Like racism, like inequality, like things that should bother us. After a while, porn breaks down your defense system. But maybe it depends what kind of porn. If you're just watching, like... I am not a porn expert, okay. so I can't, I, don't, I can't... I feel unqualified to talk about it. My, my greater point is... If someone can look at me and say, porn has really helped my life. It has blessed my marriage. I feel better about myself. I, I think women are amazing because of the porn I look at, and I want to honor them with my life. Hey, I'm, I'm willing to be wrong on this, but I, I, don't, I don't know. Now, what also, was there was, there, in the news, they, they said that you had a bromance <laughs> with Justin Bieber, <laughs> and they posted pictures, and a lot of those pictures weren't you. True. <laughs> That's so random. I like oh, to no, let not people. A, it's only like one or two that like, wasn't him. That wasn't that was him. Yeah, when, they, when they was trying to paint it as an inappropriate thing, the pictures definitely weren't you. Like the guy in the pool. Right. Yeah, that wasn't you. So, no, sir. On. So they're saying that that pretty much that the reason Justin Bieber stopped his tour was because of his conversations with you. Right. Is, is there any truth to that? No, sir. And if you look at his Instagram where he, he spoke on his own behalf, it, that's only people who speculate like that don't have any context of what it means to have a pastor or a friend and... Justin made his own calls. Uh, he he made his own decisions. It's not my role to tell this boy, this man, really, man of God, what to do. He's he's going to do what he's going to do, and I'm going to sit there and say, I'm with you. If he asked for advice, I would give it, but that's not my primary role. It's, I mean, why, why would I have a hand in him canceling his tour? Why would I want believers mad at me? They mad and at you, too. Some of them. I mean, some of them. Most of them understand that if, you love, if you're a fan of anybody, you want them to do what's best for them, but Correct. there were a couple people that were mad. Yeah, some of those photos were weird. They weren't me one time. <laughs> <laughs> one, like, one time, one time, I I, I I leaned in to listen, and I saw a couple photos that you know tried to make that something. It's not. I'm like, I'm 38. I, mm -hmm. I've been married for 14 years, and this is you know, I've known <laughs> Justin forever. Like, how desperate are we to, to manufacture stories about? Like, you know, I think it's weird that we live in a time where like, if you see somebody genuinely doing something good, the first thing we think is. You want to, something's we, inappropriate. Yeah. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? I wrote, like, I wrote about it in the book. Like, it's so much easier to go, the, Bre the Breakfast Club isn't for real. They got to be doing something wrong rather than go, how have you three? How many markets are you in? 70 plus. 70 80 plus. 70. Oh, 80 plus. Okay. 80 markets. It, it, it's easier It's easier to look at something that's doing that's going well right now and hating on it mm -hmm. than it is to go, what can I learn from this? Right. And that so people, me. like I talked to a reporter one time about the Justin thing and I was like, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing weird. He's like, I just don't believe it. I don't believe that people can make their own decisions without heavy handed. You know, I said, I'm, I, I, it's sad that you feel like that. Like what if, what if he's just making good decisions? Like, right. why can't you just believe that this is legitimate? And you know? if you have said something that has touched Justin and caused Justin to like, Clearly, he's changed. I mean, to we, we, see, right. we remember when he was at a few years ago. We see where he's at now. Clearly, but he's changed. I, I feel like a relationship with God changes your life. Do we have a factor in that? Well, you, you've helped change. You, you're a good friend to me. You've mm -hmm. we've had great combos. So there's a lot of factors that go into somebody changing their life, and we get way too much credit for that stuff. We're, we're a local church. Yes, we do support. Yes, we do bring help. But Justin's made good decisions that are based on his relationship with God. No man gets credit for that. And I think. Um, but yeah, have we had a hand in it? I hope so. I hope I've made I made his life easier and a little bit more supportive. But at the end of the day, you know, it, 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 we need to, we need you. You said it well. We need to look at things that are going well and clap for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it bugs me out because I know you, and like I'm like, well, that's who Pastor Carl is though. Like he Pastor Carl sends me messages all the time, encouraging yeah. me and 
prayers and like I mean all the time for no reason. Mm -hmm. So I'm like that's who he is. Like I think, but that's that to me is is the essence of community and life. And but if you don't know church, like and you don't know the way we do church. This is an, an, uh, uh, a succession of years of help, encouragement, mm -hmm. guidance, wisdom, conflict, challenge. And so you see, it's like looking at the Instagram that somebody has arrived. Instagram doesn't show you the days where you fall on your face. Nobody Instagrams their bad days. Like, here I am again, stuck in the same place. <laughs> like, no one wants to, you know, no one wants to talk about that. And that's a shame because those are the moments that make you. So when people see Justin doing better, or anybody doing better for that matter, yeah, it's cool, but understand where, you know, where Envy came from. Understand what Angela's been through. Talk, don't just ask you about the bestseller. Mm -hmm. Ask about what it was like to grow up in South Carolina, you know, mm -hmm. with nothing. That's who makes you who you are. And it's the same thing with Justin. He's worked hard over a long time to make better decisions. And, you know, I'm proud of that, proud of him. And I think that's the hope for everybody, that anybody can change. That's what we want. But you know what? The truth to the matter is they really don't want that. They want him to keep getting in trouble. They love they the clickbait. They can keep having content. Like, yeah. They don't want that. It's nothing, when it's positive, there's nothing to talk about. Mm -hmm. So I got to turn it into something. You're exactly right. That's exactly right. And you, you mentor a lot of people. You mentor Kevin Durant. Uh, I saw you with J.R. Smith. Smith. I've known J.R. for a while. I yeah. love that dude. He's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and I think for us in New York, people ask us about you know celebrities all the time. We always say it's just proximity. You know, we're in a city that is filled with guys in the industry, girls in the industry, in the, in the, in the New York life. And that's all it is. But people are people. I don't care how much you Y'all know that. Y'all are celebrities. So it's like, do you have different problems than other people? Not Maybe they look a little different. I'm a celebrity, but I, stop it. Wax would disagree. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've seen you. Oh, stop it. Yeah, Y'all y'all know who you are. Your platform is incredible. God has done that in your life, and it is what it is. But I have found that I, that's that chapter in there about, you know, certain dudes getting baptized. The point of that is, like, we look different races places faces but when it comes down to it what do people need they need to be loved they need forgiveness they need grace i don't care if you're famous or completely anonymous we need the same things i love the uh, jesus had instagram yeah what do you think he would show us <sighs> i think he would have had a lot of trolls yeah. <laughs> absolutely i think <laughs> absolutely. and he would have he would have he would <laughs> he would have got back to them with just a quick block like a heavenly block like sorry i i we, I like that, a heavenly block. I'm going to start <laughs> doing that. I'm just going to heavenly block people. I mean, history history softens our view. And I think um, with Jesus, we forget that he was so controversial in his day. He was murdered, murdered for, yes, doing, for doing nothing but helping people. Yes. Like, and, oh, Jesus gave his life. He got murdered. Right, to the point where Jesus healed somebody who had been lame his whole life. And before anybody said, hey, congratulations on walking, they went straight at Jesus for healing on the wrong day. Right. Mm -hmm. So it gives us a little bit of hope that when people sometimes try to say things that aren't true or, or they have something to say about you at all, this is our legacy. If you're going to follow Jesus, be prepared for people not to get it, not to understand it. But if Jesus had an Instagram, I don't think a lot of religious Christians, I mean, I don't think they would like the God that saved their life because he hung out with the wrong people. Yep. He hung out in the wrong places. Mm -hmm. He didn't have the right associations. Spoke out against the system. He spoke out. He was a system breaker. You talk about a revolutionist. I mean, you, you look no further than Jesus because he, he really came to destroy the social status of the day, the religious foundation of the day, and I think that's amazing to me. Why is that, though? Why is everybody who's ever come here and, you know, had an honest word to give people, we, we they get killed they tear them down like i mean i there will be no haters of this interview i can see it now everyone's gonna be like that was i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> oh i know they're, 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 they're gonna say something because like we just said it's too hard it's, it takes more work to get to know something that's far away so we have a phrase in church that says distance creates distortion mm -hmm. so if i'm far away i don't know if that is that in and out or is that mcdonald's this is life or death the only way i'm going to find out is mm -hmm. to walk up closer so you look at me on the Breakfast Club, or you see Envy with he's is he a rapper? Is he is he a mogul? Is he a DJ? He's I don't Spanish. know. Yeah. Is he Puerto Rican? <laughs> is he black? Um, the only way I'm gonna get to know Envy is by walking up to him saying, "Tell me your story." Right. That takes work. Right. So people want to be lazy. It's easier to say Charlamagne hates white people. Why else would he have a book with that title? Or you know, the Breakfast Club is, it, you have to pursue intentional relationship to get clarity. And people are too lazy to do that. So, ah, uh, you know, he's a charlatan or, ah, uh, Bishop Jakes is a heretic. or mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Hey, take your time and go go do your research, you know. 
Show some effort. But like you said in the book, you see a guy and he's all dressed up and he has on the fancy jewelry. Right. You're like, oh, he must be, you know, a big time drug dealer. Right. And instead you find out, actually, you know, the drug dealers get rental cars. And <laughs> the real hustlers mm-hmm. hustle. And yeah, I think that the point of that story in the book is if you're who you say you are, you don't have to promote yourself mm-hmm. all the time. People are going to find out, you know, because hard work and, and, and people who are passionate about others, that stuff shows out. So we're in New York where people are always talking about themselves. And I think it's cool to sometimes um, show and prove, let the mic do the talking, so to speak. Yeah. Let's, let's end talking about gold in the garbage. What does mm. that mean? I think there's a lot of things that we throw away in this culture that has a lot of value. And I've found that, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And I think my life is evidence of that. Um, there's a lot of people who might be listening who someone has said your worth has been devalued by um, what you've done, where you're from. And I would look at that and say, that's garbage. I think there's gold in you. And the whole point of that story, my friend and I, Joel, we found a man in a trash bag one day. And, and we were just on this really you know, dark lit alley. And we found a man in a trash bag. He obviously was homeless. And both of us just you know, took a breath and thought, where have we gotten to where people are literally so discarded and so, and so devalued that you can live like this. And, and maybe there's somebody who's not literally in a trash bag but you feel like your life is worth less. And I, I just disagree. I think there's gold in people. I don't think it's ever too late to start getting it out of your life. And that's my purpose in life, I think. I think it's y'all's purpose too, is to bring hope to people to say, hey, you can do more than you think you can. God's possible. You know, God's grace in your life is, is, is more powerful than you might realize. Well, you know, you gotta leave us with a prayer. Always, on the moment. Thank y'all for having me. I mean, it. it's an honor. Let me pray. Let's do it. Angela. <laughs> Cool pants, by the way. See you. <laughs> Jesus, we thank you for um, a new day. Thank you that everybody has the right to, to come to you and, and get grace when we need it. So, Lord, I pray for anybody listening that you would bring hope to the hopeless today. You bring healing to those that need it. We pray for our cities. We pray for our country. We pray for our government, Lord, that you would continue to have your way. Um, we thank you for what you've done. Jesus, we believe that the best is absolutely yet to come, and we love you. Thank you for bringing us here today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pastor Carl Lynch, own the moment. Go get Thank the book y'all. right now. It. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.